Good morning, ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech Hawaii. We're doing Community Matters with Rabbi Itchel Krasnjansky of Chabad of Hawaii. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning, Jay. Nice to be here as always. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a couple of holidays I'd like to discuss today. One of them just passed uh, only a few days ago. Last time we spoke, we spoke about it coming up, and now we're looking at it in the rearview mirror, and that's Tisha B'Av. And I think some people refer to Tisha B'Av as, what, Tubav, uh, the ninth day of Av, um, if it's a serious holiday. Can you talk about it? Sure. Tisha B'Av, um, which is, as you say, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, which was last week, is, is the saddest day in the Jewish calendar because it marks many, many tragedies that took place um, to the Jewish people throughout our history, uh, beginning all the ways back from uh, the Torah, the Bible, in which we read about the story that when the Jewish people were in the desert, uh, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, um, sends 12 spies to enter into the land of Canaan and to uh, report back as to how to conquer the land. Because as you recall, the Jewish people having left Egypt, they were destined to go into Israel, which at that time was called the land of Canaan. So Moses sends these 12 spies to, uh, for a reconnaissance mission. And they come back with a very, very negative, disparaging report, basically saying that there's no way we could uh, win over the 31 nations that occupy the land. It's futile. And threw the entire nation into despair. And um, so the Torah says that God said that you are weeping for nothing. You're crying for nothing because, in fact, you can overcome them and you can conquer the land. But because... Uh, because you lack the faith, this day forever will be a day of sadness, a, a day for real, a, a cause for weeping. And uh, ever since then, that day has been marked as, uh, as a tragic day. So subsequently, the, the two temples in Israel, many hundreds of years later, were both destroyed on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth day of Av. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians on this day, and the second temple was, was destroyed by the Romans on this day. And then many other tragedies happened on this day. Uh, the, most, uh, the, the most obvious one and the saddest one is the um, Spanish, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 happened on Tisha so it's considered a, a sad day. It's a day that, that, we can, that we mourn the destruction of the temples primarily. It's a fast day, a 24 hour fast day and there's prayers, it's like Yom Kippur. But what's interesting is, you know, uh, you cannot keep uh, a Jew down for too long because in our DNA, we are wired to be happy and positive, even, even, within, even amidst the uh, the tragedies. So today, actually, is Tuba of. You mentioned Tuba of the fifteenth day of of, which is a mere six days later. And the Talmud says that there was no great greater joyous day than Tuba of. Uh, primarily in the in, in in the biblical times, Tuba of was like. Like what, what is today is Valentine, known as Valentine's Day. That's when uh, the boys would go meet the girls. And, uh, it's, and that was one of the many things that happened on Tuba Av. And the commentaries point out that Tisha B'Av is, the, sad, is the, lowest, <clears throat> the lowest of the low in terms of uh, sadness. Tuba Av, which is... Which is, which is just a mere six days later, is the most joyous day. So the, the, the journey from, from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high is uh, very quickly and, um, and, very, and, and, and in, very, in a very short time, we are transformed from mourning to rejoicing. Mm. Especially, yeah. 
why, why do I feel this, uh, this is relevant uh, in the time of COVID? You know, we have COVID, we have the, uh, the failure of the American economy, and we have parallel, parallel phenomena in, um, in Israel. Um, and there's a lot of um, trouble in Israel along similar lines, I think, between COVID and the economy. Uh, I read Haaretz, you know, and uh, I, I see this every day. Uh, and then, of course, we have that uh, bombing, the explosion. It's not clear what it is um, in Lebanon, in Beirut today, which, which just demonstrates uh, how fragile uh, the Middle East is in general and that things like that, that things that are very violent and destructive happen. Uh, so how, what, what lessons, aside from what you've said already, what lessons uh, do Tishabov and Tubov have for us uh, given all the, mm, the instability of uh, the Middle East? Well, um, there's a principle in, in Jewish mystical teachings that every descent, every negative uh, occurrence is for the purpose of a higher ascent is a stepping stone to get us uh, even further along. In other words, that the, 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 the destruction was there to pave the way for us to be able to attain a higher level. It wasn't just a setback, but it was a setback in order for us to grow. And uh, generally speaking, the idea of the destruction of the temples is not the destruction of the physical structure of the building, that the buildings were burnt down, but really it's more of a spiritual dislocation. It is when a person spiritually um, uh, is severed from their gravity of, the, the gravity of center, their center gravity, and we become lost and forlorn. The, the, the uh, fact that we're scattered, you know, we understand the exile, the tragedy of the exile is that once the temples were destroyed, the Babylonians came in and burnt the temple, they, they scattered the Jewish people and sent them into exile. But it's not just a, a, a geographic scattering, but it's also a scattering in the sense that we uh, are now dislocated from our core truth, our core reality. And the purpose of the destruction, the descent for the purpose of a higher ascent is that somehow this experience serves to allow us to pull it all together in a much deeper way. And this is, and, and, and this is really, the work of the Jewish people in the diaspora. And this is our uh, aspiration of coming back to Israel with the coming of the Messiah. It means that once we totally heal and we pull, pull it all together and we center ourselves, so then th that is the restoration of how things were in a much deeper way. Because when, when something is broken and you fix it, it's stronger than, it, than before it was broken. Well, let me ask you a question, uh, um, but I think it's a hard question. <clears throat> a question only a rabbi can answer, Rabbi. Um, <laughs> so how do you know when, you, when you're riding the right road? How do you know when you're mm, in the process of fixing it and it's getting better, not worse? How do you know when we're climbing you know, out of a out of a problem time. Well, well, well first of all, uh, for that we have the Torah. The Torah is referred to as like the blueprint, the blueprint for life, the blueprint for living. And we, we turn to the Torah to get our direction, to get our guidance. So it's all spelled out in the Torah. Now, granted, the Torah is a little cryptic and it's like a code, because on the surface, it's just stories and laws but um, if you dig a little deeper, and that's where the commentaries come in, specifically the mystical teachings of the Torah, we find that it actually, it, 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 it speaks to life and how a person should live life and how a person can live life fully. 
and and as you know and to fix it as as we as we're talking about but also it's instinctive it's also instinctive a person a, a, a person instinctively knows if they are on the right path or they're lost now the the, the problem is that you know if you're lost for a long time you just accept it and you just make you know you make a life you know the best you can but um every once in a while we get this little uh, zing you know uh you know uh, whispering to ourselves you know are we actually doing something meaningful with our lives are we uh living life as our creator intended us to live so uh these are these are the wake up calls that God sends our, you know, along our paths. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a moment for introspection. Certainly, uh, COVID, either here or in Israel or anywhere, uh, is a wake-up call of asking us to uh, take a look, re-examine, um, reorient ourselves, uh, ask whether we're, we're living our life the way we, the way we should be, whether we're being productive uh, in a in a physical sense. Uh, and in a spiritual sense too. Well, let me reintroduce our, our guest. Our guest today is Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski. Um, he is uh, the rabbi, the chief rabbi, I would say, of uh, Chabad of Hawaii. Chabad is a, is a, I mean, I say a worldwide organization emanating out of New York City. Uh, and it has deep roots uh, in Israel, of course. And so Rabbi, let me ask you about the next holiday to follow, which I believe the next holiday is what people refer to as the high holidays. That's Rosh Hashanah and a few days later, Yom Kippur. So these are the most holy, the most important, am I right? Uh, Jewish holidays in the calendar. And uh, I know we're not there yet. They don't happen until September, but I would like to sort of get started on, on examining what they are and what they mean to us. Okay, sure. And actually, you're not, we're not too early because, um, you know, within the, the structure of the Jewish calendar, you know, we are well prepared for Rosh Hashanah uh, by the time it comes around because the entire month before, which in Hebrew is called the month of Elul, is referred to as the month of introspection because that is the time when we take stock of, of, you know, how the year has gone. And that's the time when we make the... Uh, the resolutions for the new year, Rosh Hashanah, first and foremost, is uh, marks the beginning of the Jewish new year. And Rosh Hashanah, the new year, immediately ushers in the 10 days of repentance, which culminates on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the 10th day from Rosh Hashanah. So it is a time of introspection, as you say, and it's also a time of celebration. But uh, the emphasis is on introspection. And uh, I, I guess that, um, that uh, as you say, now that we're living through COVID, uh, even, you know, it lends itself for a double measure of introspection. <laughs> you know, how, how, um, how we go forward and make the best of a terrible situation. So, um, you know, the difference between the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and the secular New Year, December 31st, January 1st, is that, you know, uh, secular New Year is all about partying and celebration, beginning with the ball dropping in Times Square. Uh, but for the Jew, um, Rosh Hashanah, for the Jewish people, Rosh Hashanah, uh, beckons us to ask the questions that we mentioned before and to, uh, you know, about life, about um, our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, and uh, to work on ourselves. And even though that, that seems a little somber, but uh, as we said before, uh, in, in Judaism, you know, joy and happiness is a constant, a constant companion. Even when we take stock of ourselves and we take stock of, 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 of life around us, 
you know, the emphasis is always on the positive. And, and, and what more can we do to, to bring out that positive that there is in life and in the world? You know, Even it reminds the, me of the Fiddler on the Roof. This is not, <laughs> not my namesake, um, where he sings about Lachayim. He sings about life. And uh, I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? You have to be joyful that you are alive and that you can enjoy life. And, and uh, th th what you're saying so much reminds me of that song in Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, I mean, you know, life is a, is a, is a continuous celebration from the moment we are brought into this world until uh, we pass on. And unfortunately for many people, along the way, we get burdened with, with different things and different experiences and that saps us or has the ability to sap us from our, our natural joy. And uh, very often people, you know, consciously or subconsciously just throw in the towel and just, uh, you know, continue existing day by day. But well, let me, let me uh, sort of uh, take a, a slight digression here, Rabbi. So in COVID, not only, yes. not only uh, you know, in the U.S. in general, but here we have deaths here and, and, our, and our curve is spiking here, more threatening yet. Um, and of course, in, in Europe and, and of course in Israel, people are dying. And, and with the, the, uh, the very unpleasant thing about COVID is you usually die alone. Uh, you don't even have family around to support you. You, you die with uh, the hospital system surrounding you. And um, it's very it's troubling and uh, dying is troubling and that's troubling. And you're, you're you know, speaking of, um, you know, religious principles, um, you know, philosophical principles about, um, you know, living life. But what about living death? Uh, what is what is a Jew or anyone uh, to do to handle this this uh, dreaded way of dying, uh, which which is going to come to a lot of people before it's done, this dreaded way of dying uh, uh, from from COVID. Well, that's a very very uh, difficult question. I mean, death in general is a very dreaded, uh, a very uh, sad uh, event, and uh, God forbid for those who died in the setting that you mentioned away from family, that's, uh, that's really, 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 really beyond words in terms of how sad it is. Um, you know, the only thing that, uh, you know, that, that comes to mind is, first of all, we have to do everything we can to stay healthy. And we have to be, uh, I don't know if we have to go overboard in terms of paranoia, but we have to be very, very cautious and very, and very careful, and uh, and we all know what we have to do to stay, to stay healthy. To right, uh, God forbid if someone does um, uh, get the virus, and it's and it's uh, thank God for most people who comes and goes. I was just now in New York for several weeks. And uh, over there, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an alternate reality. Uh, people go about their lives without masks for the most part. I didn't see the social distancing. I also didn't see people getting sick. Uh, maybe they already experienced that in the very beginning of the, of the virus. Uh, but that's a whole other discussion. I mean, well, just one one point to that is, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and um, and she said, um, you know, a month or two ago, she didn't know anybody who had contracted the disease, and and that's consistent with my experience too. I just didn't know anybody, but she said, in the past few weeks, half a dozen people that she knows have contracted the disease. Wow. And, you know, uh, I, that's also consistent with my experience. So as the numbers go up, it seems to get closer. And, you know, your concern should be that much greater. And your um, mindset on how to deal with the risk and the eventual possibility, um, you know, you have, to, you have to think about it. And that's, well, I, I interrupt I, you to yeah, just mention yeah, that. No, 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 I, I hear what you're saying. So first of all, in general, 
something which is very, very uh, foundational in Judaism is that our, our faith in God, that, uh, that God is with us and uh, whatever step of our journey, even the final step. So, uh, and that's also a source of strength because, you know, ultimately God is the healer of all flesh. And um, surely, God forbid, someone uh, is, is wrestling with the, with, with the virus, that we pray to God for, you know, to be healed from it, not to resign, God forbid, to, you know, and th there's a lot of progress uh, going on now, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis how it was at the very beginning. You know, percentage-wise, much less people are dying uh, today from the COVID as they were dying uh, earlier on in the pandemic. Now, in general, uh, about death in general, just a comment about death in general, which interestingly, interestingly, according to Judaism, according to the Torah, death was imposed upon mankind after the sin. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And one of the repercussions was that God decreed for man to die. So it's not by design. It's not originally we were not intended to, you know, to die. And as a matter of fact, the prophets speak about a day, a time when the Messiah comes where death will once again be abolished and there will no longer be death. There will be eternal life. But in general, um, you know, depending on how you live, that's how you approach death. A person who lives, uh, you know, a good life and tries to be a good person, moral person, to and to, you know, make your life impactful. These people, for the most part you know, pass on with, you know, it, 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 it doesn't create a, a crisis. You know, there's less fear associated with death. It's the person who, you know, wasted his life or lived a life that uh, with many regrets, etc. That person, those people, from what I understand, have a much harder time accepting death because you feel that you're being taken away and you haven't, you, you, you haven't filled your time while here, you know, a, 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 as good as you could have. So in general, you know, you know, when it comes to, to death, in Judaism, by the way, death is not the end of the road. Death is when the body and soul part the soul, the body is buried from, from dust to dust. From, we come from earth and we go back to earth. But the soul is eternal because it's a part of God. It's a godly spark within us. And that's who we are. The body, so to speak, is only our envelope, right? The person is the personality, the character, the spirit. The, the spirit and that lives on. It lives on in a different dimension, not in the physical dimension. So um, there's, a, there's a very interesting story. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, who lived uh, during the, the, the darkest times of communist Russia, when they <clears throat> set out to stamp out any trace of religion. So the religious leaders were uh, arrested, some of them were killed. So the previous Rebbe was arrested in Russia in the early 1920s by the communists for his work on behalf of Judaism in, in the former Soviet Union. And while he was arrested, he was interrogated. And they tried to pry information from him as to who, you know, who are his followers that are doing the work, the, the, this quote unquote illegal work of, of, of uh, spreading Judaism underground. And he wouldn't uh, reveal anything. So at one point, the, one of the interrogators took out a pistol, a gun, and he said to him, you know, that this little toy, um, 
you know, has, has made many, many people talk, basically threatening the previous Rebbe that if he didn't talk, that he would be killed. So the previous Rebbe said that this little toy can only frighten people that have only one world, that, that have many gods and only one world, believe in many gods and only one world. But I, as a Jew, believe in one God and many worlds. So this toy doesn't threaten me. So this is the idea, you know, that, uh, that you know, it, it, somebody once explained, just talking about death, someone once explained it in a very, very simple but beautiful way. Imagine uh, twins in a mother's womb before they are born. And it's already nine months in the mother's womb. And all of a sudden, they feel that they're being pushed out from the life that they know. So one turns to the other and says, oh, how terrible it is. You know, it's all coming to an end. You know, we're, we're being pushed out and who knows what we're, we're going to, it's the end of the road. Little do they know that it's actually the beginning of the road, that they're, that they're born into this world and life begins. In the same way, in a similar way, is the passage of death. You know, we, you know we, we, we move on from this dimension, from this physical world, into a, a better world, better in the sense that it's a godly spiritual world, not physical. So yes, uh, even though that, that life is sacred and God gave us life, so we have to utilize every moment of it to the best that we can and to do good and to be the best that we can. But when uh, our journey our journey, you know, uh, comes to an end. Then we, we, we know. Then, then we transfer to the next uh, passage. Oh, you know, Rabbi, that reminds me of a slogan we've taken on here at Think Tech. It goes this way: Day one starts now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every day is day one on a new on a new part of the journey. Well, uh, I think I, I get I get the message about the reset in uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's the new year. It's a time for introspection. It's a time to reset your, your thinking, your relationship with the world and with God. Um, and, and that helps you stay in tune uh, for eventual, eventual problems that, that may be beset you, including problems uh, around COVID. So next time, Rabbi, I would like to go into um, you know, how we celebrate Rosh Hashanah um, what it means, um, you know, uh, to individual people, what they do in Rosh Hashanah, uh, and how it relates to Yom Kippur uh, 10 days later. Uh, and I'll ask you, I can tell you now, I'm going to ask you this question. <clears throat> if Rosh Hashanah is a time for uh, review and retrospection and reset, uh, why do we wait 10 days to atone for our sins? Wouldn't it be more logical? Don't answer this now. Wouldn't it be more logical to atone for our sins first and reset second? So think about that. Next time we meet, Rabbi, we're going to discuss the relationship. I would love to discuss that. It's a hosting. very, very, very important question. But that leads us to some very deep insights into the holidays. So I'm looking thank forward to Jay, as always. Thank you. And thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. By the way, okay. this, th by the way this year, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is going to be challenging because uh, I mean things can change and hopefully they will change but right now with the governor's edict that no lo no more than 10 people can congregate uh, does that mean that we're limited to only 10 people it's interesting maybe the governor without even knowing uh, picked the number 10 because that's the required minion that we need at least 10 10 men for a minion but uh, it'll definitely provide us with some interesting challenges how to, uh, how to conduct services with this limitation. Yeah. Ah, looking forward to our next discussion, Rabbi. Stay you, well, Jeff. be well. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank for you. Coming you too. Out. Have a wonderful day. Be well. Thank you. Aloha.